Today, the real truth about the wealth of nations. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and the Lizard Web. That is posts covering finance and property news. Today, I'm joined by an author who's, well, put the cat among the pigeons, Bruce Francis Shasma. Hello there. How are you? Hello. How are you? Very nice to be with you today. <laughs> well, great to have you on the show. And, uh, you know, I think there's a really, really interesting ex uh, story that I want to explore today. You've just published a book and uh, we'll put it up on the screen there. It's um, How would you actually say it? Abundonomics? Is that the right way? Uh, abundonomics. It's a combination of uh, abundance and economics. So joining the two things together. <laughs> Excellent. And the reason this is such a timely conversation, I think, is because traditionally what we've had over quite a long period of time, actually, is the accumulation of wealth by a relatively small proportion of the global population. Whereas everybody else seems to me to be sort of scrabbling around and, and, and trying to, um, you know, find a way forward. And actually, if you look at it through the standard economic lens, uh, then everybody says, well, that's just the way it is. But you started to question some really fundamental thoughts here. So take us through your, your, your key argument and your, your main hypothesis. Well, so the fund, one of the fundamental premises in economics these days goes unquestioned, uh, and that is that the allocation of scarce resources is uh, the biggest problem facing the world today. However, uh, over the last 100 or 200 years, uh, scarcity is no longer the issue that it used to be. And we now have an abundance of wealth in, in areas that we never had before. And so perhaps now uh, it's time to start considering looking at the world through a different lens, asking a perhaps different question, asking the question of all our young and up-and-coming economists and management and politicians that uh, the real question that we should be asking now is how do we distribute the abundance of, um, of, of, of wealth that we have in the world today? Because the scarcity issue, in a macro sense, has been solved. So this is really interesting. So what you're saying is it's not that we don't have enough. What we have is a distribution problem. That's right. Now, it, That's is, right. And is, that because, with, with, is that because a small proportion of the world's population effectively has the control to be able to you know, hold on to, or, or, or is it some other governmental or political thing that's actually driving th this um, mass, well, mass misallocation? Yeah, well, obviously it's, a, it's a, a combination of a range of things, and obviously there's a, a, a nature and, and nurture sort of aspect to this, and of course we all have thousands and thousands of years of, of uh, having to look out after ourselves and be self-sufficient. And that's understood, but uh, over the last, over the and my book alert, alludes to it as well. We have changed and we've adapted over the course of time uh, to be able to uh, to change to the to, to the environment as it um, as it unfolds, and and the world has changed a lot. There's uh, methods of distribution exist now that never existed a uh, hundred years ago when Lord Robbins and Maynard Keynes were running around in the 1930s. They, uh, you know, it, it took six weeks in a leaky boat to get things from one side of the world to the other. So we can transport goods and services overnight. We can transport information like we're doing right at this very minute. Um, in seconds to anywhere in the world, we can transfer money and, and pay for goods and services uh, electronically, electronically uh, instantaneously. So these distribution issues have been solved, uh, but we're not uh, yet motivated towards uh, uh, addressing the real needs of, uh, of people all around the world. People, people all around the world, just by the happening of where they have been born or the misfortune of where they've been born, they have nothing. Uh, and we're in a position now to help these people like we've never had that opportunity before, but we're still not. So there's still a barrier and the point of the barrier to achieving this and that the barrier that I'm suggesting that needs to be brought down 
is what we're the fundamental premise of what we're teaching in economics. And it's it's stuck in my head since I was uh, 14, 15 years old at school. This definition, the scarcity definition, which was coined by Lord Robbins, which is still promoted to this day uh, by the the Harvard University, for example, has it in their in 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 their course outline. This is what we want to achieve. This is what we want our economists to behave like. This is the answer. This is the question that we want them to solve. And so they're all coming out of these universities all around the world, in every country of the world, in every school of the world, trying to solve a problem that, in my view, has already been solved. Well, that's uh, fascinating. I was talking to Steve Keen on my channel a few weeks ago because, of course, Steve yeah. is uh, also a, an economist with a very different point of view. And one of the points that he yeah. makes is that the way economics has been taught in universities and therefore filtered through into uh, you mm. know, the mainstream, whether you're talking about within Treasury or inside the Reserve Bank or uh, you know in the political sphere, uh, it's completely flawed. And uh, it sounds mm. to me as though you're saying something the same, is that the, you know, the old ways of thinking about how economics works should be questioned because there's actually a completely different story. But if you take that uh, a bit further, presumably that does mean some redistribution of wealth from those who have a lot of it to those who have none. Well, of course, we don't want to strip. Uh, it's not. Um, we're not looking. Uh, we're not promoting communism here. Uh, uh, we're not looking at stripping the wealthy people of all of their wealth. We're looking at bringing the uh, lower socioeconomic groups of the world that need some help up to living in a standard of living that is. Um, you know, humane. Uh, there's people in the world still to this day. There's 13 million people a year uh, dying of starvation. There's 35,000 a day dying of starvation uh, every day, and we've got the ability to help them, but we're putting our collective heads in the sand. I know that there are many charitable organisations out there and uh, foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates and all all that, but um, but... It's not solving the problem. Uh, there's still uh, millions and millions of people uh, living in, in conditions that um, that uh, that uh, are appalling. Uh, I've written blogs on it on my website about what it's like to die of starvation. Uh, it's 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 a tragedy. It's a human tragedy. What's going on in the world? And of course, most people uh, don't believe there's much that they can do about it. Uh, and I often I wonder that people said to me, just go and join a charity and you can help that way. But there's so many people out there doing that sort of thing. I always thought, um, you know, uh, uh, there must be something else going wrong here, something underlying uh, it all that's driving uh, this situation. And I think it's the, the scarcity definition of economics uh, that breeds a, a greed mentality in the world. So th that would suggest then that maybe Adam Smith back in the 1770s didn't have it com completely right. And I suppose it also suggests maybe that greed is no longer good. Well, greed, you know, greed is obviously has been a wonderful thing for the world. You know, greed driven economies all around the world have led us to the situation that we now have an abundance of uh, wealth and assets. Um, so it's been very good for us. But even I think it was um, was it Maynard Keynes that uh, suggested that, but not by the nineteen by twenty thirty that there would there would possibly be uh, a time when the benefits of a greed driven economy were outweighed by the negatives. And I think we're pretty close to what uh, Maynard Keynes was suggesting. Absolutely. Well, uh, you only have to look around today and. Uh can see the um, disparity between um, you know the relatively small rich uh, particularly western world and, uh, and many other parts of, of the planet and i suppose you can even expand it further to things like um, water for example you know there's enough water around the place um, but it doesn't necessarily get to the places where it should be um, um, delivered to receive uh, perhaps greater impact you know, obviously uh, water is an excellent example i mean the world's covered two-thirds with water and we've known how to uh, desalinate water for thousands of years. We pump oil and gas all around the world, uh, you know, for thousands of kilometers because there's a profit in it. 
Uh, but when there's no profit in it, then no one's interested in doing it, regardless of whether or not there's uh, the money or the uh, the ingenuity or the uh, you know the ability to be able to do it. They don't do it because it, there's no profit in it. So, so you know, to some extent, we need to remove the profit mentality from uh, the discussion a little bit and do what's better. Uh, do what's you know do what's good for you know for the people these people in these countries they're no different in their needs and wants uh, if you want to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of need they're no different from you and I they just happen to be born into tragic circumstances and I think it's incumbent upon the rest of the the population of the world the people that can help should help and and we're not helping we're we're throwing, uh, we're, we're fluttering a little. I mean, I know that people will tell me that Bill Gates and Elon Musk and all these people, Warren Buffett, and uh, um, uh, do 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 put money into these things. But I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a small percentage of what they are able to do. Yeah, and you actually make the point that one percent of the population holds 60% of the wealth in the world, which is an astonishing statistic when you actually hold it up and, and look at it. And I think you also which make- Go on. Yeah, increased by, increased by six or 7% since about 20 years ago. So it's getting worse. Absolutely. And uh, I was gonna say that the COVID period and the inflation period were both times when in fact, the wealth drifted even more to the small proportion of the people holding you know, the massive amounts. I guess what we're talking about then is a need to rebalance the scales, as it were. But I guess my question is, how do you go about doing that? I mean, obviously, raising the issue is a really important first step, and that's what your book is doing. But where do you, where do you go after that? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. And I've been asked uh, by a lot of people what the solution is, and uh, they're expecting me to have... Uh, all, all the answers, but what I what I, the intent of the book is to put it out there for discussion in amongst economic students and uh, the education system because you know the other thing that's in abundance is a uh, you know in the world is there's a lot more people and a lot more brains and uh, than just me and I think that the it's in I think the the children of the future should be given this question to solve. Uh, I don't think it's for me to solve, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, I want to open up the discussion and be involved in the discussion as to how we can move forward. Uh, there's been thousands of years of this uh, mentality built into our, uh, into all our systems and, and our cultures and our governance, uh, and it's going to take a, a, a fair while to unwind. So it needs to be uh, a spread through the education system um, discussion point, and we need to question. Uh, the fundamental premises of uh, what we've been taught in economics. I mean, the world has evolved um, uh, in multiple ways over the last hundred years, but our education system, in particular in economics, is anchored in the 1930s or even uh, even earlier. Yeah, and as a philosopher by training, I'm always interested in what are the underlying assumptions that people bring when they you know, make a conversation or think about a strategy. And of course, if you are wedded to a particular economic model where effectively the scarcity is the, is the lever and it's about maximising the, the power of that scarcity, that's one story. But what you're saying is, no, no, hang on a moment. We've actually got to the point now where there's enough stuff around, right, whether you're talking water or whatever it is, it's, it's a distributional issue. That's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different yeah. political conversation, a whole different way of thinking about economics. So uh, in a way, I, I, I get what you're saying, which is, you know, let's lay the foundations. And in fact, on the uh, on the back of your book, which we'll just look at, you're talking there about scarcity has been driving the decision makers through the ages. We've got the ability now, never before, to rebalance the scales of humanity. And so the aim of the book is to create discussion with a view to attaining a collective realisation and belief that we can build a better future for everyone. And, uh, you know, that's a, a bit of a lofty uh, aspiration, but it's also a really important one, it seems to me. Oh, absolutely. I think it's important. Uh, I, uh, it, it, I I struggle with the – I struggle – I obviously, on a micro sense, scarcity is an issue. I run small businesses here in Australia, and I, I, I can only do so much with what I've got in my businesses. But 
in a macro sense, this question's changed uh, enormously over the last hundred years. And um, and I, 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 when I look at countries around the world, I, I don't see I don't see the uh, the the borders. I don't see the difference in the the, the colours of the skin. All I see is uh, people who have uh, a wealth um, and an ability to be able to assist. And a whole and an enormous amount of people that are, you know, are, are dying for for their help. And economists are charged with solving this problem, and and that's what Harvard says in their in their literature. They're, 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 this is the they need to get out there and solve this problem, but they're not solving it because, in my view, they're they're uh, trying to solve a question that's been solved. And I think that's a very important observation. And going back to what Steve Keen said, you know, unless you change the way that economists think, because that filters down then into policy, into the way that governments work, into the way that industries work. So, so it's a very important um, potential uh, shifting of the Rubik's Cube to, to think about it in a new way. And I come back, and I've said this on other shows previously, to the situation where there is enough out there if there was a will and uh, a series of mechanisms that were actually uh, to follow through from that will to be able to rebalance it. And it becomes actually then not just really a question of um, a fact about what's out there, but also it's, it's actually about political will and an aspiration to change the status quo. The trouble is, of course, that for many of those people at the, uh, at the top end of the, uh, the, you know, the wealth scale, um, they haven't got a lot to uh, gain and maybe something to lose if they do actually um, allow this alternative way of thinking to, uh, uh, to to evolve. So there is actually an interesting power question and uh, and about uh, are, they, are, are yeah. the are the people who are actually in those positions of power and in positions of wealth actually working against the rest of us? Therefore, well, absolutely, and I, and I think they are. What there's no motivation really for them to change what they're doing uh, except for you know, an altruistic sort of mentality that some of them might have to, to, to redistribute and help uh, people that, that are in need. But, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, people that will be uh, negative towards this idea. They don't want, they like the status quo. They like where they are and they're in, in control of governments and they're in control of major corporations and, uh, and, and, and they just keep, they'll want to keep plowing on with exactly what they're doing, regardless of, uh, whether they've got enough already. I mean, Mr. I mean, I don't want to pick on any particular wealthy people, but Mr. Mr. Uh, Elon Musk and his $57 billion salary package. I mean, I, I don't know. After I spent the first billion dollars going to Tahiti and, and uh, you know, to the finest restaurants in France or whatever, I don't, I'm not quite sure what I do with the next billion. Uh, you know, so that, that's, you know, it's just, um, I, I just, I have trouble comprehending the mentality of uh, what they think that they need it for. You know, uh, good on Elon for uh, creating uh, electric cars and flying to the, you know, it, but we can't even look after the people that are uh, here in the in, in the world already. So I don't know why we're flying to the stars while we're watching, you know, 13 million people a year die of starvation. I think the, the priorities are out of order. Yeah, and it sounds to me as though there's a, a political will question and a priorities question, and uh, underpinning it, and uh, you know a lot of other things as well, is the basic ec economic assumptions that you make. And uh, you know the point about the book is that you're really poking the bear, frankly, but I think really importantly because you know the questions that you're asking, which is why are things the way they are and how could they change, and think about the consequences if they were changed. That's a pretty profound. Um, starting point for a very important debate. So I want to say thank you very much indeed for sharing your, your thoughts with us on the show today. If people want to get more information about the book, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, well, uh, I've got a web website, abundonomics.info, where you can read uh, lots of uh, interesting. I blog there as well. But um, but the book is published now uh, by a London publisher, Austin McCauley. So it's available on their website. Uh, as well, and hopefully it'll be available in a bookshop near you soon. The book itself is written in a in a tone which is easily read by people of all sorts of academic backgrounds. So a lot of times economics books are difficult to digest, 
and uh, I've, I've written it this way intentionally. So it's available for, you know, anyone who has an interest in uh, uh, and a fairer and more equitable society for everyone. Terrific. Well, as I say, we've put the links and things below. And uh, certainly, uh, as I've had a look uh, through the content, um, it was clear to me that you've actually written it in a particularly powerful way because there's a lot of detail for those who want it, but you can also um, work through it quite uh, easily without actually getting drowned in the, in the economics. And of course, some, some economic books are not really um, very interesting, but I found this one a really fascinating read. And uh, the issues that you raise are absolutely important for us to consider. So thanks very much, Bruce, and uh, best of luck with the book. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.